Welcome to my channel. This is Dr. Emmanuel. I want us to do a very quick revision on the anatomy of the spinal cord. If this is your first time to my channel, I hope you get to learn something or at least join me in this you know, revision and refreshing your knowledge. So let's start with this image. This is an MRI, sagittal plane MRI film of part of the spinal cord, the vertebra. So this is a T2 weighted sagittal MRI of the lumbar spine. And within this MRI film or image, we can see part of the spinal cord. So this is the terminal part of the spinal cord. So this is lumbar. This is the lower thoracic and the lumbar part of the spinal cord. So this is the conus medullaris, okay, which is the terminal part of our spinal cord. And down we can see fibers of our spinal cord, which is which are, which constitute the cord equina. Okay. And we can see our in, we can see our vertebral bodies, intervertebral discs. So let's go into further uh, details of the spinal cord. Just some important facts which we will look at again. So the spinal cord starts at the level of the C1 vertebra. So that's where it starts as a continuation from the medulla oblongata. So the medulla passes through the foramen magnum and then you know becomes the spinal cord. So at the level of the foramen magnum slash the first cervical or cervical vertebra C1. The spinal cord has some areas of enlargement or you know, with, with dilatation, which are called enlargements. And we have two of such, the cervical enlargements, which is in the cervical parts of the spinal cord. And we've got the lumbosacral or the lumbar enlargements, actually the lumbar enlargements of the spinal cord. So the cervical enlargements are from C4 to T2 segments of the spinal cord. It's widened compared to the rest, you know, the diameter of the rest of the spinal cord. And we have another dilation or widening of the spinal cord at T12, L1, you know, vertebral bodies, the level of the vertebral bodies. So um, in an adult, the lowest extent of the spinal cord is usually said to be L1. So it's almost, so we will say L1 or L2 vertebral body. That's the lower extent, you know, of the spinal cord in an adult. Whereas in an infant, which is a child or a baby, you know, zero to 12 months old, spinal cord is a bit lower at L3 vertebral body. And here highlighted, we can see the lowest extent of the subarachnoid space is at L3 segments, the S3 vertebral body. And just to recap, the subarachnoid space is that space that lies between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. I think we did mention it in one of our previous videos when we looked at the ventricular system of the brain. This is a transverse section of the spinal cord. But before I come to this transverse section, I want us to actually have a longitudinal view of what the spinal cord looks like. This is a sagittal section of the vertebra of the spine. Um, shows the occipital bone right there. It's our foramen magnum, which is the widest foramina, you know, widest foramen of the base of the skull through which the medulla oblongata joins or communicates with the spinal cord. So this is our cervical, you see this portion looks wider than the rest of the cervical spine. So that's the cervical enlargement, C4, C5, C6, C7, T1, sometimes T2 usually up to from C4 to T1 is wider. We have the lumbar enlargement, okay? T11, T12, L1, okay? And then we have the conus medullaris, which is the termination of the spinal cord. It's called the conus medullaris, which is at, you know, L1, L2, depending on usually L1. So this is spinal cord. The spinal cord lies within the spine, within, within the vertebral canal. And the vertebral canal is different from the spinal canal. There are two different things. The spinal canal is a very narrow opening that runs within the spinal cord. If we go, so that's the spinal canal. That small opening in the middle of the spinal cord substance. Whereas the vertebral canal is that space within the vertebral, you know, the verte within the vertebral bones or the vertebral column within which the spinal cord and its immediate surrounding blood vessels, nerves, you know, lie. All right. 
So yeah, within, so these are vertebral bones. You can see the vertebral canal running all through, okay? Vertebral canal is that space that lies between the posterior longitudinal ligaments of the vertebral body and the ligamentum flevum. So when you put all these spaces together, it gives you that vertebral canal. So let's go back. So let's move back to this. This is transverse section of the spinal cord. Transverse section of the spinal cord. It shows, it shows us the gray matter and the white matter. In the brain, the gray matter is outside and the white matter is within. So we have the cerebral cortex, which is gray matter, you know, on, on the peripheral part of the cerebral hemisphere on the brain. And then you have the white matter within. In the spinal cord, it's the reverse. You have the white matter outside, peripherally, and we have the gray matter within, okay? And um, so this is what this, this, this is, this is right in the middle. So this little opening here is called the central canal and not the spinal canal, okay? And this central canal, you know, it's it continuous with the ventricular system proximally and distal it ends blindly. So there's no these two distally is not in communication with the subarachnoid space or with any any CSF containing space. It ends distally. Okay. It's called the central canal. Whereas the the space within Whereas the space, you know, within the vertebral body is called the vertebral canal, which is also called the spinal canal. So the vertebral body the vertebral canal is also called the spinal canal. Well, that's tiny, narrow space, you know, opening within the within the spinal cord, which is lined by the ependymal cells. It's called the central canal or the ependymal canal. So I just needed to mention, you see it's different from the vertebral canal. The right and left halves of the spinal cord anteriorly are separated by the anterior median fissure. Okay. And posteriorly, they are separated by the mid posterior median sulcus. So apparently sulcus, is less prominent than the fissure. Because the posterior one is called the sulcus and the anterior one is called anterior median fissure, not anterior median sulcus. We have the bat wing shaped, you know, spinal gray, gray matter, it's bat wing shaped. We have the anterior horn, we've got the lateral horn and we've got the posterior horn, okay? Anterior horn, the lateral horn and the posterior horn. And then we have the spinal nerve roots, spinal root, nine nerve roots. We have the ventral roots and the dosal roots. Right? Yeah. On the anterior part of this gray matter, we can see this is anterior gray horn. We can see that it's actually, you know, carries um, somatic, somatic, you know, nuclei. Motonuclei, both somatic and visceral motonuclei. Whereas on the posterior part of the gray, the posterior gray horn is usually, you know, usually subserves, you know, somatic and visceral sensory nuclei. Okay. And this is this is the gray matter commissure, which is commissure means a communication. So anterior gray matter commissure, posterior gray matter commissure. Commissure is a communication between the gray matters or between two parts of the brain, whether either gray matter or white matter. Remember in the brain, we saw the largest commissure which was the corpus callosum, which was a white matter commissure. So the commissure here in the spinal cord is a gray matter commissure compared to the white matter commissure, which is the corpus callosum in the cerebral hemisphere. I've extracted a few information from the internet uh, just for us to highlight. You know, actually, not from the internet. I think I got this from Frank Netters, you know, human Anas, human, Atlas of Human Anatomy, Frank Netters, likewise, some of the images. So compression of the coda, compression of the coda equina, which is the bundle of nerves below the spinal cord, for example, by a large central prolapse of an intervertebral disc, may disrupt bladder function, you know, sphincter, both anal and bladder sphincter control, and also produce bilateral sensory and motor abnormalities in the lower limb. So if you have a compression of these bundle of nerves below the spinal cord, which is called this bundle is called the coda equina. Coda equina literally means the tail of a horse. Coda is tail, equina is horse. So if you look at it, it's shaped like the tail of a horse. If one of these intervertebral discs or a spinal tumor presses on this, you could have neurological symptoms, paralysis, 
you know, bladder and bowel problems. Another important fact, at the level of the upper border, so the spinal cord starts at the level of the upper border of the C1 vertebra, which is the atlas bone. The spinal cord is directly continuous with the medulla oblongata through the foramen magnum. Inferiorly, the cord usually extends as far as the first lumbar intervertebral disc, where it terminates as the conus medullaris. So you, in an adult, as we said earlier, usually the spinal cord terminates at the level of L1, so it was the L1 vertebra or L1 intervertebral, L1, L2 intervertebral disc, sometimes at the level of L2 vertebral body, but usually L1 vertebral body. Spinal cord receives its arterial supply from the anterior and posterior spinal arteries that arise from the vertebral arteries. And they are, this blood supply is reinforced by branches of the deep cervical, intercostal, and lumbar arteries. We'll get to see, you know, the blood supply of the spinal cord in another video. The spinal cord is essentially, especially wide at the cervical and lumbar enlargements due to increased numbers of nerve cell bodies within the spinal cord, which innervate the upper and lower limbs. So those areas of widening, the cervical enlargement and the lumbar enlargement, they are widened because they contain more nuclei. So you have this, you know, remember we have the lumbar plexus and we have the uh, we have the cervical plexus, we also have the brachial plexus, which is composed mainly of cervical nerves, you know, um, cervical nerve roots. So we have more, more nuclei, you know, subserving, so, you know, providing enough innovation for your upper limbs and your lower limbs. Cerebrospinal fluid is usually sampled by inserting a needle between the arches of the third and fourth or fourth and fifth you know, lumbar vertebrae, we'll get to. That's just clinical relevance. What they're trying to say is that if one wants to do a spinal tap, a spinal tap or, um, you know, a subarachnoid tap, usually you put your needle between the L3 and L4, just so you're staying away from the conus medullaris. Somewhere there, your needle goes in, okay? Sometimes L4, L5, so very far off from the spinal cord. So we've explained this image. Let's move on to other things, right? But still on this image, we have what we call the phylum terminale. So the phylum terminale, so the cauda equina is a bundle of nerves that also includes the phylum terminale. But the phylum terminale itself is this, this structure, this fibrous structure right, that extends right from the conus medullaris in the midline the one that is highlighted in black. So phylum terminale, the part of it that lies within the dural sac is called phylum terminale internum. And when it pierces, when it goes beyond the dural sac, it's now called phylum terminale externum, of terminale or terminal external. I think it's Latin. So this is, this image demonstrates the meningeal covering of the spinal cord. So just like the brain, the spinal cord is covered by three layers of meninges. The dura, so the dura, the arachnoid matter, and, and the pia matter. When we looked at the meningeal coverings of the brain, we realized that the dura had two layers. It had the periosteal and the, you know, the, in, the inner layer, which was the meningeal layer proper. And we're also told that the spinal cord doesn't have that periosteal layer of the dura. It has just the proper meningeal layer or the internal layer of the dura. So this is the dura. If you peel off the dura, you have the arachnoid matter. And if you peel off the arachnoid matter, you have the pia matter, which is in direct contact with the spinal cord. Between the arachnoid matter and the pia is your subarachnoid space. Now, usually within that subarachnoid space, you have cerebrospinal fluid baiting this, you know, baiting the spinal cord and the brain. Okay, yeah. Something um, if we look here, we can see we have rootlets. So rootlets, these very small roots are called the rootlets. So rootlets join to form the roots, and the roots join to form the ramos or the rami. So we have the rootlets, posterior rootlets, anterior rootlets. Posterior rootlets come together to form the posterior roots of the spinal nerve. 
the anterior root led to join to form the anterior root of the spinal nerve. The posterior root and the anterior root will join to form, you know, the remi, the remus. And then, so this is a remus, and this remus divides to give you the posterior remus of the spinal nerve, which is usually sensory, and then the anterior remus of the spinal nerve, which is usually motor. Okay. Looking at this cross section of the gray matter of the spinal cord, we can see that it also has the anterior horn. It has the posterior horn, which is usually for, which is usually sensory. The anterior horn contains motor nuclei. And we have an we have a lateral horn on both sides. This image gives us a graphic topographic, uh, a topographic you know orientation of how the spinal cord sits within the spine. So this that's a spinal cord extending from the from that's the medulla. You can see that's the rhombus, the rhomboid fossa of the fourth ventricle, the floor of the fourth ventricle is rhomboid. And there we have a foramen magnum right there. And then on spinal cord, you know, continues all the way down to the level of the L1 vertebra. That's L1 vertebra right there. So L1, L2 intervertebral disc level. That's where you have the conus medullaris. And you have this bundle of nerves called the coda equina that continue, you know, to supply your lower limbs, forming your, you know, your lumbosacral plexus. They form the lumbosacral plexus. This is the dura. The dura terminates at the level of so the termination of the dural sac is at the level of, so this L1, so about L2, L3 intervertebral disc level, that's where the dura terminates, okay? I remember phylum terminale, right in the middle, from the conus medullaris going down. So is that part of the, the part of the coda equina that is right in the midline, that's the phylum terminale, that's it. And when it pierces the dura, it becomes the phylum terminale externum or externa. So important landmark, the dura, dural sac, ends at the level of the S2, S3, some, sometimes S1, S2, S2, S3 intervertebral disc level. That's where it ends usually. So something else I would like to highlight here. So if we look here, we can see that the C1 spinal nerve from the, the C1, the first cervical nerve root, spinal nerve root, emerges, spinal nerve emerges above the C1 vertebra. So C1 nerve, spinal nerve emerges above the C1 vertebra. C2 emerges above C1. And it goes that way. C7 emerges above C6 cervical vertebra. And then C8 cervical nerve emerges above C7. So for the for the cervical spinal nerves, a cervical spinal nerve emerges above the vertebral body, which is one step above. So C2 emerges above C2. C8 emerges above C7. C2 images above, C2 images below C1, C3 images above C4, and it keeps going that way. When you go to the thoracic, T1 is under T1, T2 is under T2, T3, and it keeps going that way till you get your sacral nerves, okay. So just a recap. The spinal cord terminates as the conus medullaris, important fact. And below that, we have lumbar and sacral, you know, um, sacral spinal nerves, um, you know, forming this coda equina. Spinal cord in an adult usually ends at the level of L1, sometimes L2 vertebral body, and in an infant, L3 vertebral body, the dural sac ends usually at S2, S3, or, you know, yeah, S3, S2, S3. Spinal cord begins at the C1 level, at the foramen magnum of the skull, where it's continuous with the medulla. 
transverse section of the spinal cord, we have the anterior horn, we've got the lateral horn, and we've got the posterior horn. Anterior horn is usually motor, posterior horn is usually sensory. We have the gray matter commissures, anterior and posterior. We have the anterior median fissure, posterior median sulcus, okay? White matter surrounds gray matter. We have the posterior and anterior nerve roots, okay? Roots, so the rootlets, join to form roots, roots form to join the ramos, and the ramos divide into posterior and anterior rami. Covered by the dura, arachnoid, and the pia. Between the arachnoid and the pia, you have the subarachnoid space that contains CSF. In another video, we will look at the blood supply, both the arterial supply and the venous drainage of the spinal cord. So if you think this video has been helpful in terms of revising the basic anatomy of the spinal cord and its immediate surrounding meninges, I would say kindly like this video, subscribe, share with friends that you think would benefit from this video. Thank you very much.